Alan Schneider, welcome all the way from Jerusalem. Thank you for joining this conversation today. Nice to be here, Dan. Before we get into the politics, which everybody really, I think, would like to hear about, uh, you initiated uh, a program in Israel, which really now has taken root uh, and has been widely acknowledged uh, as having filled a historical void. And what I'm talking about is the program to honor Jewish rescuers of Jews during the Holocaust. So tell us about that program and, and tell us uh, really how, uh, how it's grown to be what it is today. Well, Dan, maybe I'll tell you about uh, first uh, about an event that will take place next week uh, at which we will be presenting um, 200 Jewish rescuers, uh, most of them posthumously, uh, with our Jewish rescuer citation. These are all Jewish rescuers uh, who were active in Hungary. Uh, and as you know, um, Hungary was the last country to be invaded by, by the Nazis. And the Jewish community there had quite some time to organize itself in order to um, try to uh, rescue and, and protect uh, the Jewish community there. Regrettably, about half of the Jewish population uh, in Hungary still was uh, annihilated, 400,000 out of 800,000 people. But there were many hundreds of Jews, Jews who were engaged in rescue activities, uh, organized particularly by the Zionist youth movements, um, uh, who had uh, a very solid um, organizational base already. So um, we will be uh, traveling to Kibbutz Hazorea, and we'll be, as I mentioned, pr presenting um, uh, posthum posthumously, except for two uh, women who are still alive, who will receive the citation, bringing us now to about 800 uh, persons who ha will have received the Jewish Rescue Citation that was, uh, as you mentioned, established by the Neighbors World Center and the Committee to Recognize the Heroism of Jewish Rescuers During the Holocaust. And um, I know we've had a chance, uh, I participated in one program here, uh, actually in New York City, um, with one of the uh, rescuers who lived in, in the Riverdale section of, of the city several years ago. Um, how, what is the, what's the research process for this? How do you find um, these, these folks and how do you establish the story? Mm -hmm. Well, it's sometimes not an easy process. Uh, we have, um, to, to some degree, taken a leaf out of the uh, book of Yad Vashem, which, as you know, has been presenting since the 1960s their um, award uh, for, uh, to righteous among the nations. These are non-Jews who uh, went beyond the call of duty and endangered themselves to rescue Jews. Uh, uh, we felt um, that it was time, uh, this is now 20 years ago, that it was time to recognize Jews uh, who did the same, also put them, themselves in danger, maybe went out of hiding, uh, or um, um, did not take the opportunity to uh, go into a neutral uh, uh, country, for example, but stayed in dangerous environs in order to help to rescue others because, others because they had the opportunity and the knowledge uh, of how to do that. Uh, so we uh, really hold ourselves to a very high standard and we seek out um, uh, written information, documentation. We um, um, will access uh, archives and research uh, institutions in order really to dig deep and uh, make sure that we we understand the context of the story and actually what this individual uh, has done. We begin many times with um, submissions that are made to us by family members who are interested that their uh, loved ones, who, uh, as, as I said, is in uh, you know, most cases today uh, are no longer alive, but that they be recognized um, after many years uh, of uh, have, having received no recognition and, and not being known to the general public. So we, we see these submissions of family in many cases. Uh, of course, they know the uh, perhaps the, the the story as it was told um, by the grandfather or and then the next generation. But uh, sometimes they're lacking um, the um, two independent uh, sources that that we need to have in in order to uh, actually uh, present the award and and and. Um, and so uh, we work with the families, uh, as I mentioned, um, if they need help in finding additional information. 
in some cases, unfortunately, we're, we are not able uh, to reach the standard um, of proof uh, that that we need in order to make a presentation. And um, you know, I can tell you that there, are, um, in quite a number of cases, uh, uh, families are um, uh, unhappy that uh, uh, our determination was that uh, the that level of proof that that, that we've set for ourselves has not yet been met, uh, and we keep the file open. Uh, and um, we're working now on on more than one case where we're trying to work with the family and see how we find the um, you know the end of the string and start pulling and and finding um, uh, some evidence about what they know, um, what they believe to be the fact that we need uh, hard evidence, either testimony by persons who were uh, rescued by that individual or um, academic works that were written uh, and, and based on uh, hard um, hard evidence. Alan, let's move now uh, into the political realm. Israel just had an election not too long ago. It's fifth in a very short period of time. Uh, there will be a new government. Um, can you speculate uh, a little bit uh, on how its relationship with the diaspora will be, uh, its relationship to the administration? here in the United States. Uh, what do you see ahead? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Dan, we're still waiting for the, the government to actually um, uh, to be formed. Uh, there has been a very rough month since uh, the election um, uh, and since actually Netanyahu received the mandate to form a government. Um, uh, we all in, in thought, uh, apparently including um, uh, Netanyahu himself, was the um, Perspective of uh, uh, prime minister, we thought that this would uh, be much easier because uh, Netanyahu now is finding himself really in a coalition of the like minded uh, in many ways. This is the first time that he is actually on the left um, uh, end of a, a government where all of his uh, gov his uh, par coalition partners will be to his right, uh, religious and, and right. And um, uh, I think that um, it, this is a new uh, a kind of uh, situation uh, uh, for him. I, and uh, there are a lot of expectations by um, the members of his um, uh, prospective coalition, uh, particularly regarding um, uh, settlements, uh, annexation, um, uh, support, you know, for the ultra-Orthodox, uh, and and things of that sort, and um, the 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 rest of the general population really is 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 expecting him to moderate uh, all of those uh, expectations and to to bring some uh, uh, set order to to this uh, new incoming government. Uh, I think it won't be easy because there, as I mentioned, there were great expectations. There was a buildup over the last, particularly the last year and a half, of frustration among that same electorate. Uh, that was unhappy um, uh, about um, what was happening under the Lapid uh, and Bennett government vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, settlements. Um, and uh, particularly now we see this new, this wave of terrorism uh, that is uh, very disconcerting to everyone uh, here. Um, uh, there was an um, uptick uh, in uh, terrorist attacks and violence. And, and the question is how um, what measures they're going to take to bring this under control, uh, and, and at the same time, not to unravel the relationship with the Asper jury uh, and with the U.S. administration. Um, uh, you know, uh, Netanyahu and his uh, former administration, uh, he served during an Obama administration where there was uh, quite a lot of uh, static and, and uh, friction between uh, the government here and the, the administration in the United States. We saw that on Iran and on other issues, settlements, uh, and um, we're kind of expecting uh, there to be similar situation coming online now. We've already heard statements from the Secretary of State and from the uh, American ambassador here in Israel uh, regarding um, the opposition of the, of the administration to uh, annexation of any kind and so on. So um, I think that uh, we're going to have to keep our eyes open and, and watch how this uh the ship uh, begins to sail. Alan, I'd like to shift gears here a little bit and talk about two big anniversaries that are coming up uh, of interest to us as Jews and as B'nai B'rith. Um, one is the 180th anniversary of B'nai B'rith uh, next year. 
Uh, and the other is the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948. Now, with regard to the anniversary of Israel's independence, um, we have a real rich history in, in the early years uh, leading up to the creation of the state. And perhaps you could take a few minutes uh, just to talk about some of those contributions and some of those uh, important chapters in both B'nai B'rith history and in the history of the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Dan, you know, uh, B'nai B'rith really has uh, foundational shares uh, in the uh, Jewish presence here in the land of Israel and also actually the establishment of the state of Israel. Um, you know, it was back in 1888 when the first B'nai B'rith Lodge in um, land of Israel and Eretz Israel was established in Jerusalem, named it, called the Jerusalem Lodge. And all the members of, the, of that lodge were leaders of the new Yeshua, of the, of the Jewish community, emerging Jewish community at the time uh, in the land of Israel. And that lodge, the Jerusalem Lodge, undertook really uh, fantastic uh, activities that helped to lay the foundation for the, the state that eventually um, uh, was born. And I'll just mention a few of them. Um, you know, uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, we held a major conference in uh, Paris on the Hebrew language. And uh, we held it on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the passing of Eliezer Ben Yehuda, of course, was the father of modern Hebrew. Well, Ben Yehuda was the secretary uh, the first secretary of, of the Jerusalem Lodge. And he was the one who insisted that Hebrew would be the language that the Lodge would conduct all of its meetings in, even though he allowed others who didn't know Hebrew to, to use the language they were um, uh, comfortable in, but Hebrew was the official language. Uh, and it turns out that was the first place in the modern era ever that Hebrew was used in a, a daily uh, for daily use. Uh, and B'nai B'rith at the time also established schools for Hebrew teachers so that they could then teach uh, children. And in fact, also, is, they established the first two Hebrew kindergartens in Jerusalem. So all of these activities helped to uh, ensure that, that Hebrew would become the lingua franca here in Israel. We all know today, and this came up in our conference in, uh, in Paris, you know, how important the revival of Hebrew was for the rebirth of, the, of Commonwealth in the state of Israel. Uh, so that's one major uh, contribution that, uh, that B'nai B'rith made, because those same people also in, in the Lodge established uh, a, um, a group called Safabrura, which is basically the precursor of the Academy of the Hebrew Language. Uh, and all the members of the Committee of the Hebrew Language that predated uh, the Academy were members of the B'nai B'rith Jerusalem Lodge, outstanding linguists uh, among them, like uh, um, David Yelin, for example, uh, and, and, and others. And they um, uh, brought people together and promoted the Hebrew language uh, in many other ways as well. So that's that was a very important contribution. Uh, another important contribution was the establishment of the National Library. And... Um, that library was established in 1892 by the Lodge. It was the first lending library uh, in Jerusalem, and in, in fact, in the whole country. And 10 years later, after 10 years of effort, they, uh, they inaugurated the first purpose-built building to serve as a library in Jerusalem. That building is still owned by B'nai B'rith and sits on B'nai B'rith Street in Jerusalem. Uh, the uh, collection that was built up in that library until the 1970s was transferred to uh, the Hebrew University, uh, where they uh, had the university and national library. And in a matter of months, the, the state of Israel, with funding from the Rothschild family, will open for the first time since our building on B'nai B'rith Street, a, the independent national library of the state of Israel, in a, a very striking building uh, near the, the in the government quarter in, in Jerusalem. So again, that was an, another major contribution that we made uh, and um, that actually until this very day uh, is having its impact here in the state. Alan, one final question. I know that uh, you've just completed uh, a one-week visit uh, with European members of parliament. This is 
part of a program that we do every year and bringing diplomats, bringing members of parliament for a chance to see Israel in a week-long stay that you organized. Tell us about that and why it's important. Yeah, Dan, this was a, a mission um, of uh, four, of five members of the European Parliament from Latvia, Spain, Sweden, uh, Slovenia, and Croatia, and also a representative from another member from Germany. So we had um, a representative from six different countries uh, in Europe on this mission, um, uh, and uh, literally ended just uh, hours ago. Uh, Dan, we've um, we know that there's no substitute to visiting Israel, uh, getting to know the people, just experiencing walking the streets, visiting Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Jaffa, uh, and uh, meeting the people. And some of the, the the folks on this mission were first timers in Israel, and so uh, they really we they really I think um, uh, opened their eyes as to because you read things in the press, you. Um, uh, watch uh, television, you know, you get an image of what a country looks like with people, uh, how they behave, and, and um, um, you know, in many cases, that's, that's not accurate. And so we uh, are convinced, and have been for many years, that there's no substitute to actually visiting uh, uh, the state, meeting people, getting briefings from the foreign ministry, meeting with members of Knesset, which we did, uh, meeting with representatives of the IDF, uh, and uh, touring the old city of Jerusalem, touring Jaffa. We met we went there and um, met with um, uh, students in a Jewish Arab elementary school, uh, which was a, a very interesting experience. Uh, and that's something I think that our um, our guests experience, uh, expected uh, a school, a bilingual school with uh, Arab children, Jewish children who are learning in both languages and is funded 50 percent by the government uh, of the state of Israel. Um, and uh, really, in a very short time, we had um, you know many really great experiences together. Uh, not least of which were the meals and the and the outstanding uh, food that there is today um, uh, here. So uh, you know we really see importance in bringing these kind of missions. Uh, we've done it uh, many times in the past. Uh, um, it can be diplomats from the UN, ambassadors. Um, uh, UN ambassadors from Geneva, from uh, Paris, uh, UNESCO, uh, and others. And, um, uh, you know, we look forward to uh, hosting other missions in the near future. And, um, you know, thank you for supporting those efforts. Well, and thank you uh, for joining us uh, from Jerusalem. And thank you also for all the work that you do as our representative on the ground in Israel's capital. Thank you, Dan. Take care.